Welcome back to Act 2 of Summons Only. If you have not seen part 1 of this run yet, then make sure that you check it out before looking at this. Anyways, let's begin. Heading towards this crash, we run into a lady looking to smuggle out a kid. Normally I'd be against it, but if we help her, we will get a really useful item down the line. Destroying this wall, I use a trick we will be reusing a lot with Connor. By walking into the room, the encounter with the invisible Grimishka starts. This surprises him, but after his demise, they are now completely visible. And so, I can use Shovel to instead surprise them myself. Using Connor as a meat shield, this fight goes without much trouble. And I move on to cheese a couple of Gith guarding the entrance from above. Killing some eagles and a few kobolds. We make it to the crash. However, we are nowhere near ready to take them on yet, so instead I move back to the Grimforge and use the elevator to officially enter Act 2. Instead of taking the normal route, I decide to sneak up on Karnis and his gang. Convincing him that the lantern is mine, I get them to walk off into the curse without any protection. It will become apparent soon enough why we have to do this. Anyways, I pick up the lantern and already we have protection from the shadow curse. Killing a couple of Shadowhounds, I discover a trick that can basically trivialize any encounter in the game. You see, there is no limit to how many times I can summon Connor, and each time I do, he is counted as a completely new unit, meaning that he has his actions fully back. This means that as long as the turn order is right for it, I can summon Connor, hit one time with him, and then just resummon him again, repeating the process over and over again until any fight is won. This is quite boring to do, and it takes a very long time. So I won't be using it anymore, but it's still a cool thing to know about nonetheless. Making it to last light, we buy the usual Cloak of Protection before running over to Moonrise Towers, where we find Carnage and his squad turned to undead. Making sure to scurry around them, I approach Moonrise, where Mizora appears, telling me that I need to rescue a devil that got caught by the Absolute. Speaking to Sorel, she gives us the key to Balthazar's room, and within, after interacting with the rightmost bookshelf, and placing a heart onto the altar, a secret room opens up. Inside, we find a ritual circle that normally, if interacted with using Gale, will let him combine a dead pixie found on the table with a broken moon lantern to create the shadow lantern. But since I am dumb and left Gale to die in Act 1, I cannot do this. However, most of you seem to agree that it's alright that I console commanded in, since the mistake was just for me being done. So I did just that, and bada bing bada boom, we have the shadow lantern. It comes with the Conjure Shadow Wraith spell. Using it on anything that used to be alive summons a shadow. It is resistant to nearly everything and goes invisible as soon as it moves. With our new ally, I decide to challenge the As of Patch 6 heavily buffed Shambling Mound. It now has a legendary action that does 3 to 30 damage to anything that ends its turn near it, alongside letting it instantly kill whatever it has restrained. With its 200 HP, it is slightly out of reach for us currently, so instead I decide to just go for its smaller, easier to kill allies. And after a couple of turns of feeding it corners, I decide to retreat after reaching level 7. This level gives us access to level 4 spell slots, and also gives us the Conjure Minor Elemental skill, letting us summon either an Angry Dwarf, a couple of mod methods, or my preferred one, these Ice Boys. Since we have level 4 spell slots, we can now upcast Create Undead to raise 4 Undeads instead of 2. We do only have one level 4 spell slot, and I don't really feel like waiting for level 8 to be able to cast both, so I head back over to Moonrise. Entering the basement, I hold Person the Warden, killing her before she can react at all. And on her corpse, we find the Spellcrux amulet. This lets us restore any one spell slot once per long rest. And if you want to restore my faith in humanity, why not hit the subscribe button? It is completely free, and you can always just unsubscribe later. Running into the Gold Goblin, I convince her, after a few rerolls, that she doesn't need to be here, and she just implodes off screen. We run into Raphael, and after shooing him away, kill a pack of Kuatoa from up on top of this cliff. Now it's time to take on the Gauntlet of Shar. I immediately rush over to Balthazar's chambers, but both the fight outside his room and the fight with him inside of his room are way out of our league. So to solve this, I use invisibility, making sure to sneak past the event trigger and open his door. 
This lets me merge combat between these two fights right away, and we go straight into the longest fight in the game. It lasted over an hour, so I won't bore you with all the details, but in short, Balthasar was destroying people, I was definitely there, and there was a lot, and I mean a lot, of summoning going on. You know, just a casual plus 15 people outside of what can even fit on the screen. And so, after around 30 minutes straight of fighting, I managed to bring down the big crusader. And another 30 minutes after that, I managed to bring down Balthasar and his big boy brother Flesh. What an absolute massacre. On his corpse, we find the reason we had all entered here in the first place. The Circle of Bones. It comes with Animate Dead, and gives any allied undead, which almost all of our summons are, permanent resistance to all physical damage, as long as they're within my reach. This is by far the best helmet in the game for us. I quickly solved the three trials of Shar, and move on to challenge Yurgir. This fight is as exciting as it gets. I tell him to go kill himself, because trust me bro, and he just listens. No wonder Raphael was able to trick this guy. I unlock the way over to Night Song, but we are far from ready to do that yet. And so instead, I head back over and purchase the Darkfire Shortbow from Damon. It grants us resistance to fire and cold damage, and lets us cast haste for free one time per long rest. It is time to deal with the rest of the Thorm family, starting with Thistlebald. He can just like the gold one be talked to death by simply succeeding a couple of sleight of hand and performance checks. Moving over to the House of Healing, I kill one of the sisters and get level 8. But before using it for anything important, decide to take care of Malus and his little cult. Malus works just like the other Thorms and I get him to happily slaughter his sisters and then himself. With level 8 now in our disposal, we're going to do something a bit unexpected. That is respecking into Paladin of all things. I make sure to become a Paladin of Devotion, and after putting 3 levels into it, spend the remaining 5 levels on our old friend the Beastmaster. But why do we want Paladin? Well, to answer that, we first need to break our oath, which is exactly why we picked the Oath of Devotion. To break this oath, we simply have to kill any innocent bystander. With our oath broken, the Oathbreaker Knight shows up, and after speaking to him in camp, we are now officially an Oathbreaker. Since we're level 3 Paladin, it gives us the control undead action, letting us use the power of our oath to subdue any undead creature with a level lower than us until long rest. But even so, because we are no longer wizard, our lineup of summons are only these four. So this undead had better be good. And great news for us, it is. Remember how we forced Karnis and his gang to wander out into the shadows? Well, it turns out that any creature that gets turned into a shadow cursed undead is counted as an undead, and therefore we can turn Karnis into our own personal bodyguard. He has 220 HP, an aura that gives any allied creature Feature, including himself, an additional 1d6 psychic damage on all attacks, and a legendary action that lets him do a huge amount of burst damage should anything within his aura die by an enemy. He also deals a very balanced amount of damage himself. The only sad thing about Karnas is that he cannot be healed, so currently he is an insane asset to us, but he will just last a couple of fights before running out of health. With Karnas now at our side, we easily take out the fight with the shadows outside the morgue. Getting some weird looks in Last Light, I also go down into the basement to pick a fight with the Mean Locks. Hasting Karnas, he casually one-shots this one from 63 HP, and after a few turns, deals with them all. Mostly by himself. Heading onwards, we enter the basement of the Mason Guild, and ambush another bunch of shadows. This fight is not easy, and would definitely not be possible without Karnas. They all have, just like our Shadow, resistance to basically everything. Normally you would just need to deal some radiant damage. But none of our summons can actually do this. Karnas gets extremely bullied, but I still manage to finish off the fight using Shovel as a sacrifice to trigger his legendary action. At this point, he is quite low, so I decide to just end him myself. After paying the 1000 gold fine for regaining our oath, I respec over finally to Druid. Putting 17 points in Charisma, since we got plus 1 from Ethel, I go for the Circle of Spores subclass. Making sure to grab Dual Wielder at level 4, we get our first unique Druid ability at level 6, Fungal Infestation. This gives us a couple infestation charges every long rest, letting us raise up to 4 fungal zombies. They do a fair bit of damage by themselves, and any target they attack are infected. 
which upon dying will also become a temporary zombie for us. Level 7 once again gives us Conjure Minor Elemental, but also the highest DPS summon we have access to currently, by far. Conjure Woodland Beam. It summons a Dryad that can itself summon a so-called Woodwode every short rest. Has access to our first actual damaging crown control, which, since some AI in this game is quite dumb, can be very effective, and after buffing its weapon using a bonus action, can pull off some really good damage numbers. Spore Druids also get Symbiotic Entity, letting us spend our transformations on a huge amount of temporary HP twice per short rest. Level 8 gives us another feat, and I decide to put it into Heavy Armor Master. The only bad thing about going Druid is that we lose Necromancy, and thus can only summon 3 Skeletons instead of 4, but aside from that we are now way stronger, with 3 Skeletons, 4 Zombies, a Shadow, a Dryad and her Woodwode, Shovel and our 2 Methods. All of these summons are quite weak in terms of hit points by themselves, but this can be solved by casting 8 on them using another character, with the current level giving them all plus 15 health. Since this consists of me and 13 summons, that's 210 extra health. With our now very tanky team, I decide to finally tackle the crash, starting off by bullying this trader. You know, a casual 14v1, that seems fair to me. After taking out the other guards chilling in the corner, I loot her corpse and find the Amulet of Branding. It lets us once per long rest brand an enemy, making it weak to any physical damage of our choice for one attack. This might not sound very impressive, but it can lead to some very high damage numbers. And it is one of the first ways we have to actually increase the amount of damage our summons can do. I continue on to the hatchery and convince the egg keeper to let me take his precious egg. Trust me man, I wouldn't just give it away to some smuggler. Entering the doctor's office, we convince her to let us use her special tadpole extractor. Things don't go to plan though, as after succeeding a few saving throws, instead of getting rid of it, we awaken it, getting the awakened buff. This will come in very handy as we don't really have anything to spend our bonus actions on. I give the doctor her well-deserved reward and head onwards to challenge one of the Kithrax. Forgetting that she has fear, she manages to fear almost all of my summons, but luckily I manage to save it, letting me hold person her for a quick kill. Only thing left to do now is kill the Inquisitor. This fight doesn't actually start until we either talk to him or hit him, so I am free to spread out my summons however I want. Since our Dryad is by far our hardest hitting one, I begin by hasting it and hit the Inquisitor with Shovel. He has a legendary action he can trigger twice per turn whenever he or an ally is hit by anyone. It lets him summon a sword with a fairly chunky amount of HP that hits quite hard. Even with these though, they are still severely outnumbered. I use Bludgeon the Weak and get a nice 40 damage hit in using my Dryad, followed by an Entangle, before killing him the turn after. With the Inquisitor down, his swords disappear with him and it's just a matter of time before the remaining Gith also fall. After the fight, some big lady threatens us, getting really angry that I don't know who she is. And on my way over to the Blood of Lathander, I managed to somehow do this. I couldn't find any way out of this, so it's time to run all the way back around. Anyways, I collect the Blood of Lathander and head back, giving away the Gith Egg to Eshter. Now it's time to once and for all tackle Moonrise. But before heading over there, I make sure to open the secret way down to grab the 3 plus 5 temporary stats and anger a few sentinels. I start this fight with a fairy fire that I managed to land on two of them. These sentinels are not pushovers though, as they smite shovel and one shot Connor. Thankfully, they all seem extremely set on killing me in particular, instead of my summons, as they tank 5 opportunity attacks just to hit me once. I evade a smite and surround the very same one, managing to kill him. At this point I was certain that this fight was in the bag, I even got a nice entangle off, but then out of nowhere this guy pulls out a spirit guardians. Thankfully this damage is quite low, but AoE damage is definitely the biggest weakness we currently have. I managed to break his concentration and finish the fight a few moves after. Returning to the gauntlet of Shar, I enter the massive pool of water and arrive at Night Song's prison. Heading down to the bottom I free her and return to take on Sorel and her literal army of soldiers. 
Oh boy, that's a lot of actions that needs to be taken. I feel like I'm going to be here for a while. By far the scariest enemies in this fight are the adepts in the back. They can all cast Hunger of Hadar, a very strong, continuous AoE damaging spell. Since they are so far in the back, it is quite hard for me to at all hit them, but for now we can at least prone them with the ice methods, temporarily stopping them from ruining us. My Dryad gets its spike growth counterspelled, allowing me to land a fairy fire on Zarel. This makes it very unlikely for any of our summons to miss her, but this big ogre decides to almost kill itself in order to stop me from concentrating. Sorel gets off a nice cone of cold, and the zealots show up, deleting Jahira in a single turn. This means that we are already in a very bad spot, and so to not instantly lose, we will have to just kite them backwards, hoping that they willingly kill themselves on our spike growth. Zarel goes down just in the nick of time, but one of the adepts manages to get a hunger down. This forces me to go all the way down there and attempt to break his concentration with a hold person. Thankfully this succeeds and I make sure to finish him before he can break free. I get some help from the harpers to finish him off and to be fair to them they are actually doing a pretty good job. The zealots just don't seem to ever run out of smites though and they take out most of my melee units before the other adept uses another hunger. This time I fail the hold person but my dryad and skeletons still manage to bring him down. I heal it using a transfuse health twice, and now, with most of the dangerous ranged units dead, it's just a matter of kiting them all backwards, forcing the enemies to walk straight through the spike growth. After that giant clown fiesta, I realize that there is still one summoning item that I have yet to get. So returning to last light, I come across he who was. He needs our help finding some old ledger that this woman had, which we do right next to what remains of Thistlebold. After returning it to him and helping him torture a already dead person, he awards us with the Raven Gloves. These gloves lets us summon Quoth the Raven, which sadly is a familiar and a very weak one at that, but it's always an option, so better getting it now than regretting not getting it later. I quickly take care of the Necromites guarding the roof and reach level 9. This gives us access to level 5 spell slots and the Conjure Elemental spell. It has 4 possible summons, all of a different element. For example, the Fire one has a multi-attack and can throw fire in an AoE. With level 5 spell slots, we can now also use our Animate Dead to summon either a Flying Ghoul or a Normal Ghoul. But since we are no longer a Necromancer, this will only give us one, so sticking to the three skeletons is definitely better. Lastly, before confronting Kethrick, I head over to his bedroom and find a letter from his long gone wife. This lets me, as I confront him, try to persuade him away from fighting us. Which actually seems to work, that is, until the stupid Night Song shows up, making him change his mind last second, fighting us after all. This fight has two really scary aspects to it. The first one is Sustera. As I got teleported up here, with all my summons in a single place, she can easily destroy any chances we have of winning by fireballing me just once. So killing her is top priority. This goes very well and she dies without even getting a move, but here is where the second, even worse thing about this fight kicks in. You see, Kethrick has an aura around him called Legion of Bones. This raises an incubation egg that at the end of its turn will spawn a Necromite in its place. Oh yeah, by the way, all the Necromites has a 10 health Armor of Agathus shield, just to make things even more fun. Somehow, the skeletal egg created from Sosdera hatches without even entering combat. It's a bit bullshit, but okay. A Night Song goes in, managing to land a nice smite on Kethrick. He smites her back, almost instantly killing her, and uses his deadly orders on me, making all the Necromites target me the following turn. The chance our summons have to hit Kethrick is absolutely minuscule at this point, so yet again, Again, it will be crucial to land a fairy fire. But even so, thanks to the fact that he has resistance to all physical damage, the damage we do when we actually manage to hit him is still really small. Kethrick downs Aelin and one-shots one of my fungal zombies. Here I get to learn that the incubation, for some reason, is counted as an item, so our zombies can't even attack it. Thankfully, at this point, it does not really matter, as our water elemental lands two good damage hits letting me bring Kethrick down low enough to trigger the cutscene, in which he bodies Aelin and escapes away with her. I finish off the remaining Necromites, 
and loot Kefric's big chest for the Ring of Exalted Marrow. Temporarily, this is the best option we got, as it gives us an ability called Exhort the Risen, which works exactly the same as Command, except on Undead. Following Kethric down the hole, we enter the Mind Flayer colony. There is no turning back now. There are three things we have to do down here, preferably without losing any of our summons. The first one is in the morgue. Here we run into a very old friend, us. To get it free, we have to get the key from Chop. And well, it just so happens that he walked into the wrong neighborhood. After releasing us, it gives us both the ability, summon us, but also the item, summon us. This is important as we can use the ability before a fight and then use the item during the fight to re-summon it without even using an action. Us has a really solid 55 HP even without aid and a ranged ability that lets it deal some pretty good damage. Moving on to the Mind Flayer pods, it just sounds too risky to open them as I really need every summon I have so I just walk straight past them and find Mizura trapped in a pod of her own. Here comes the whole reason why we are playing Will in the first place. After releasing her and succeeding a persuasion check, she rewards us with the Infernal Rapier. This rapier gives us plus one to spell save DC and has the ability Planner Ally Cambion. This level six spell summons a very bulky Cambion. It has resistance to most things and a nine to 56 damage ray of fire. Finally, we are getting some summons that actually do something. With these two upgrades, I sneak past the undead waiting in the laboratory, solve the puzzle, and collect the waking mind. Slotting it in here lets us purge the mind and gives us permanent advantage on all intelligence saving throws. It is now time to approach Kethric for the final time, but since this fight is going to be really, really hard, I want to be as ready as humanly possible. So before using the elevator, I use the one free long rest we get here to refresh my fungal infestation charges. Normally reusing a summon that is already out will simply just replace it, but that is not the case for specifically fungal infestation zombies. So by killing these four unaware cultists, we can raise another four zombies. That has quite the army we got now. Activating the elevator, it is time for the final showdown. Using an invis pot, I start the encounter by freeing Nightsong, and since we convinced Kethric to give up earlier, we can now yet again persuade him into repenting. This lets us skip the entire first phase with him. Starting the fight against Merkel right away. Although this is both a blessing and a curse, as Merkel right off the bat uses Call of the Damned, doing some huge damage to all of our summons. With his 390 HP and resistance to most things, this fight will not be easy. Starting off, I land a fairy fire on him and hit him with my water elemental. But after seeing just how pathetic the damage from one of my strongest summons is, I started getting quite worried here if this at all would be possible. And to make things worse, the one mind flayer here used as an insane mind blast on all of my fungal zombies, eliminating four of them. Using confusion, I managed to confuse Merkel, but he still hits the correct target just fine. At least he decides to frighten his own mind flare. The Cambion and the fungal zombie finishes the job, and Aelin lands a very important smite on Merkel. Merkel will, once he has fallen below a certain health threshold, call over Necromites and feast on them, regaining a big portion of his health pool. So to stop him from doing this, we need to use Darkness. And I just happen to have a singular Darkness arrow available. I managed to do some not too shabby damage, and land a crit with my Dryad. But the time is ticking and the Necromites are really starting to add up. Merkel takes out a Skeleton and Corner, and deletes our Cambion and my final two zombies go down to necromites. As it's been three turns, the darkness from the arrow runs out and I make sure to recast darkness. But at this point, I barely have any summons left and my damage is really lacking. So deciding that my only chance is to end this within three turns, I drink a haste potion and re-summon my dryad and water elemental. Dame gets in some very needed bits of damage and tossing a haste potion on my dryad it manages to land another huge crit before dying. And so with 14 HP left, I summon in a flaming sphere, and it, together with my elemental and us, manages to just barely bring down Merkel. That was way too close for comfort. Collecting Kethric's Netherstone, there is just 
one more thing to do. Kill with the Gift Patrol protecting the way to Baldur's Gate. Compared to Merkel, this fight is a joke, but I do get to show off the Dryad's true potential as it crits this one for 104 damage. Not too shabby. With them out of the way, we collect the Herakneer Bracers, giving us access to Telekinesis, a spell that will let us throw our summons into action and take the path over towards Baldur's Gate and Act 3. Thanks for watching till the end. Uh, this one took a while to make. I had some severe issues with the loading for some reason. Uh, Baldur's Gate really seems to struggle when trying to load in too many units for some reason. But uh, we got through it. Final part should be coming out next week sometime. So look out for that. And yeah, once again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.